Awesome, thank you. When I was five years old, I received the best gift that any Play-Doh loving kid has ever got. I opened the box and found vivid clay. It was modeling clay in primary colors. It was the kind that real artists use. Have you seen that kind? It's amazing. It never, ever dries up. And with the clay in my hands, I felt like anything was possible. So the first place I went was to my dollhouse, of course, and I threw away all my dollhouse furniture and remade everything. I remade the couches, I remade the clocks on the wall, even the tiny toilets. So what I ended up doing was deciding that small art was something that spoke to me. It made things feel more accessible and more tangible. And in my five-year-old mind, they felt much more special when they were small. This love of small art stayed with me. <laughs> and when I decided to go to art school, nobody was surprised. In 2013, I moved to Atlanta, and for the first year, I spent as much time as I could getting to know this city. I fell in love with Atlanta's unique murals and sculptures and the free art that you'd find on the street in the neighborhoods for people to pick up. It didn't hurt that one of the city's most revered public art venues is just blocks from my house. This is the Krog Street Tunnel. It's a 100-year-old train yard underpass and serves as a kind of proving ground for street artists. It's an unofficial community art space. People paint murals, and street artists paint there at all hours of the day without permits and without being bothered by authorities. I saw someone this morning, actually, on my way here. So for a year, I watched the tunnel, and I thought, how can I contribute to this conversation? I want to make something free, and I want to make something public, and I want to make something that contributes to Atlanta. Luckily for me, by this time, I'd found a handful of adventurous artists who said yes to new ideas. So when I said, hey, you want to glue a seven-inch door to that wall? They were in. On July 28, 2014, Door number one was installed at the Krog Street Tunnel. It was wood and cement and painted to match the style of the tunnel itself. The cement dried, and then I waited. I saw the door every day on my way to work, and I started to wonder whether the conversation might just be the door getting painted over or destroyed. I tried to prepare myself, but it didn't get destroyed. In fact, things started appearing in front of the door a tiny box of biscuits, <laughs> a pair of tiny jack-o'-lanterns, a bunch of tiny cats. I swear I didn't put that there. But it was when a tiny newspaper about the tiny door appeared on the tiny stoop that I knew the conversation had started. The idea behind tiny doors was always to encourage imagination. I saw in this big city a desire to stop, to slow down, and to appreciate the moments that can make us feel transported. And my tiny friends had become tiny volunteers, and so we put our heads together and came up with our first mission statement. Our mission was bringing big wonder to tiny spaces. Think about it. <laughs> a door that's only seven inches tall means that every single person is too big to fit. And if we're all too big to fit, it's a kind of common denominator between adults and children. It means that we all have to use our imagination together. At first, the idea was to make the doors completely anonymously. My first Instagram post said something like, look at this cool door I found. <laughs> But by standing back, we were missing out on a key part of the conversation. People didn't need to be told who lived behind the doors. That's why we call it tiny doors. You can decide for yourself who lives there. But maybe hearing from the stewards of the doors, the people who cared for them and tended to them and gave little sneak peeks, would help it feel more connected to the community. So we opened a social media account. And not long after that, the account exploded with people posting their shared experience with the doors. And not long after that, journalists began to inquire. You know, for people-sized newspapers. <laughs> and the question I often heard was, 
what's behind the tiny doors? The simple answer, are you ready, <laughs> is a lot of epoxy. <laughs> like a lot, like I could write a book on epoxy. But the articles always came back to the role of interactive art and community conversation and wonder. And so a shift started to happen. It wasn't just about bringing big wonder to tiny spaces anymore. This was about tying together communities in Atlanta. In our first year, 20,000 people visited our online map to check out the doors and to find the locations. And so choosing a location for a door became really important. So we decided, as a group, that we would wait until we were invited to a neighborhood to install a door. That way, the door would be a collaboration between the artists and the neighbors. So we had to figure out what makes a neighborhood special. How can a tiny door on your block highlight what makes your neighborhood unique? <laughs> I asked the owner of Inman Park Pet Works how a door on her block could interact with the neighborhood. She said, well, you know, we have a bulletin board that people are always posting big bulletins. What if you had a tiny bulletin board? Why not, right? So construction began. And the door was installed. But would people actually make tiny bulletins? <laughs> you saw that coming, right? <laughs> and it wasn't long after this that a local nonprofit called Trees Atlanta, they made this permit, by the way, invited us to make a door in an old American elm tree. So just in time for Georgia Arbor Day and with great respect for the tree, door number five was installed. I tend to the doors every week. And one day, as I was sitting outside this door just touching up the paint, a woman yelled at me. She said, what are you doing to that door? And I got a little scared. I said, I'm just fixing it, ma'am. She came up and we started talking. And she said, this door is in my neighborhood and I can't stand the thought of it being destroyed. And I thought, wow. She doesn't just feel this sense of wonder or whimsy. She feels protective. By the way, I've since made a suitcase and I don't get yelled at, like ever, anymore. <laughs> public artist and sculptor Janet Eckelman said, I think of public art as a team sport. The outcome is only possible with the interaction of all the players. And Atlanta is an awfully big team. As items accumulated in front of the doors, I started to think about how we're asked to interact with art. We can look at it. We can listen to it. We can take a picture of it. Sometimes we're allowed to touch it. But on rare occasion, we're invited to participate. When I asked the group of students here at Emory why they invited me to speak here today, what they said surprised me. They said that seeing the doors on social media made them want to go outside. Right, social media making you want to go outside and interact with Atlanta. And I'd never really thought about how seeing something online could make someone who is new to the city want to go interact with these people, want to go interact with their new town, and how these college students would find ways to relax and unwind. And it's also free, so that helps. <laughs> I'll leave you today with this thought. Tiny Doors ATL started as a small interjection into the vast conversation of art in a major city. Along the way, we learned, of course, that it's not about doors. It's not even about small art. The force that drives this conversation, the piece that brings adults and children and neighborhoods together, is an invitation to use your own imagination. The big surprise behind the tiny doors is the wonder inside of us all. Thank you.